many thanks to Rika, not just for the introduction, but also for the invitation. And the many things I have already learned today, with the people who do, but also from the other people here, uh, both at the university and at the technical university. Uh, I was actually here, it was it 26 weeks ago, when the students had invited me for the students symposium. And there I talked about the energy system, very large scale, global energy system activities. Now I talk about a very small scale, and eventually I want to go to the atomic scale and uh, so we get to find out what happens in this. So when I started with the non chemical inventions, which was maybe 10 years ago, we found a little inventions. I looked at it and said, this is, this is all blood magic. If this was all strange things, not easily producible, uh, nobody really knows uh, about what's going on. I would say we still don't know what's going on. At least I still so don't know what's really going on. But it's not black magic anymore. The result is totally reproducible. If you do it right, I'll show you our uh, introduction towards the very end where you see how reproducible it is. But you just have to control many more parameters, many more we have to control in your, in your conventional reactions. Because if you do a reaction in the mill, this is important how many balls you have in the mill, what size the ball you have, and the pieces of ball mill. So if you have the same weight overall, but 10 small balls instead of two big balls. The results may be very different. The ball to call the ratio in the middle to a million is very important. So we even have sometimes the problem we have many mills of the same type. If you have a new one with the feelings of all okay, the living result is different than for the mill you already seven years ago because the feelings are all gone. So you have to machine it and, and so that can create sometimes the impression very soon. But in fact, there is no rule. It, there's real effects we are seeing. And for me, the very first example, the very first example where I would say, gee, this is really the proof that mechanical forces can be chemistry, but well, actually is chemical experiment. The people here, uh, colleagues from, from uh, Munich, citations down here. They had a polysaccharide chain on the surface. They attached the tip of the AFM to the polysaccharide chain, and then they pulled away from the surface and recorded force workers with bending curves down here. And if you look closely at these force workers with quantum curves, you can see little steps in these curves. And they recorded many, many, many different places. If you look at the paper, uh, they did very careful statistics. And at the end, they could identify each of these tiny steps here in the curve, force with the extension curve, as the detection of one sugar unit from the uh, surface the sugar was attached. So really, only at a second option, always for the right chain, you could break and the loss. If you really think about it, it's, it's not so surprising. Of course, of course, you can, you can break the bond. But doing that on a molecular scale, I think, was, was quite significant. Um, and so there, there is really something that I'm a chemist can deal with, say, first shown at the molecular origin. The word is around for much longer. The very first mechanical chemical experiment actually have really looked up not in the original language, but uh, in, a, in an English translation. There is a full Greek book by Theophrastus called On Stones. And he described the mechanical chemical reaction. He used mercury uh, sulfide to be grounded in a copper water. If you grind mercury sulfide in copper water, you form copper sulfide and liquid mercury drops here. First description of a mechanical chemical reaction, we of course didn't even call it mechanical chemistry, but that was a mechanical chemical reaction. So you can do chemistry by applying forces. We don't use scanning code microscopes. 
we want typically microscopic amount of material. And so we use really mills. Most of the time we use raw mills to affect chemical reactions. And there are different types of raw mills. This is maybe the one you all know, a tumbler mill, which is big cement plants, big tubes filled with some grinding material and the powder you are grinding in these grounds rotate and produce fine material. This is an industrial scale mill with high energy input. You have it filled basically with grinding media, stainless steel balls in the simplest case, and then it's more or less like a stir. You strip around the balls, you have powder in there, and while you're stirring, the powder gets mechanically agitated and does hopefully chemical reactions. This is the type of mill we very often use in our laboratory. I'll show it to you in a second in a bit more detail. Um, this type of mill has the most interesting type of energy input. It's a so called planetary wall mill. And the action is best described if, if you have ever been with Joy White on a, on a fair. There, there are these. When I was a kid, it was called Kaka. Big round plate, it's rotating. And on the thing, there are little chairs or, or capsules which rotate counterclockwise. You have the big plate rotating this direction, the little chairs rotate the other direction. If you have ever really one of those things, you know you're really tossed around. And these things still happen in these planetary modes. So you have the supporting this and the milling vessel filled with the grinding media. If you look at the trajectory of the balls, you have really uh, grinding motion here in this direction. And then at some point, the balls detach from the wall, fly across the, uh, the space here, and then have an impact on the other side. So this is a different type of mechanical education you have in these planetary modes. If you want to scale it up, these planetary modes, the typical size is in the laboratory 100 milliliters for the milli jar. Here, the simple lawyer is a very similar kind of action. You have these blades here which rotate the bit balls which are flying around in, the, in this vessel here, and you can get these up to the size of a cubic meter. So, if you want to really produce kilogram, 100 kilograms an hour of sample, you can more or less scale the planetary mill by a so called Spinologia mill to a bigger scale. We use many of them. The ones which we use most are the shaker mill for gas plate reaction, the planetary mill for synthetic reaction most of the times. If we want to scale up, we go to the laboratory symbol. We don't have a, a cubic meter vessel. This is a two meter uh, vessel, but we basically we can get them from two meter, 10 meter, 20 meter, 50 meter. We produce them basically all the time. So really, it's difficult to scale up, but it can be scaled up. What I want to touch is four different topics today, which gives you a flavor of what we can do in the mill, what it has to do with catalysis. I first want to show you how we started. It was to become chemical depolymerization of cellulose. Then I want to talk about synthesizing the photocatalysts. You will see when I can simplify the tree very easily quite interesting catalytic systems. I'll talk about interesting materials, also in split catalysis, but also the young catalysis. And finally, I'll talk about catalysis on the milling conditions, uh, where you can see by milling and running a catalytic reaction on the milling, you can increase the activity of the catalyst by the orders of magnitude. And I don't know why, and I would like to know why together with so we can't hurt you. Now let's first start, let's start with the cellulose. That's sort of an introduction. Cellulose is a biopolymer. Uh, consists of, let's start with those, start with the ligaments. The ligaments are basically aromatic alcohols cross-linked, uh, highly interlinked, looks a bit like this structure down here. That's an interesting fraction, but the more interesting fraction for us are the sugar polymers. Cellulose consists of glucose, which are 
other neurons, the glucose molecules, more of sugar. And they are folded in a, in a sheet structure. It means that all the glucose that bonds, these bonds here, which connect the glucose grains, are extremely well protected by this sheet structure. And so the glucose is very difficult to depolymerize. On the other hand, it would be really interesting to depolymerize cellulose. In the early 19th century, you know, 20, early 20th century, so 1910, people really wanted to so called satellite wood, making the earth from wood because this is what, cons what, what is the main constituent of wood. What we do here is it's actually glucose in a polymerized form. If you can split it, you have to put it. And that would be much cheaper than having to be cane or sugar beet or whatever. In principle, it has no more to do. The glucose that they bond is actually normally quite easily split by acid catalysis. The problem is so that, that's what happens. So we use acid catalysis, and even this protective glucosidic bond we can split. The big problem is. As soon as you are here, spotty alcohols like sugars, they continue to react. And the same catalyst which splits the glycosidic bonds catalyzes all these other reactions. And you have to work under harsh conditions, otherwise, you wouldn't split the bond. So, all these reactions go on, and the worst one is the formation of units brown, gooey, bad stuff. You can't do anything with it. Maybe throw it away or burn it if you like. That, that's the only thing which you can do with humans. There's nothing else you can do with it. And so the, the dream of sacrificing wood yeah, was a dream for, for about 100 years. Now, we have actually found that if you impregnate cellulose with an acid, we use sulfuric acid in ether. And then ball mill, you can have water, you have a clear solution. So just to describe in a, in a very visual manner the experiment, you take your paper handkerchief from your pocket, you impregnate it with acid, squeeze it into a ball mill, you mill, add water, and you have a clear solution, and the cellulose is gone. And the cellulose is actually gone after you know, the right conditions, after about Hours 100 percent water soluble products after two hours, um, milling in the water under I would say moderately gentle conditions. Uh, it works not only for cellulose, which is a very clean product made from biomass, you can actually use native biomass, sugar cane for gas, the steps left over if you take on the sugar from the sugar cane. Uh, this here is beech wood. Pinewood, straw grass is not quite as good. Basically, all these types of lignum cellulose wood you can be polymerized to medium very clear solution. We can use actually the sawdust, wood chips, whatever form, impregnated acid, mill, gone. Uh, uh, not gone, soluble. This is what it looks like. Here is the what is left over of a Paper handkerchief, it's clear, completely clear water like solution. If you add this uh, water to the, to the milling product, if you have wood, it's also clear. I'm not sure you can see it, it's transparent. It's just brown. This is the aromatic ring of the lignin compound, which uh, gives, gives the brown color. And it's a bit uh, foamy because there are the, the lignin. Uh, depolarized lignin uh, acts like a surfactant. Um, it's actually partly the reason why you sometimes in fall have foam on the on the little creeks. Uh, that's typically not washing powder, which is left over there. This is natural products from from the decomposition of the lignin. If you do mass spectroscopic analysis, you see these are. So soluble compounds here are typically oligomers of sugars with a maximum of five mass. 
And all people's units attached to each other are probably both, but then you get the clear solution. For the wood, you have essentially the same, you have just more background, which is the different limit structures, which you cannot easily resolve because it's pretty early final. And so this process really allows you to depolymerize or tweak the glucose. You have converted then the product further, uh, to use chemicals from it, and you can make interesting chemicals for fuels from wood. I don't want to go into that detail because it has nothing to do with mechanical chemistry. We want we can discuss it later. Um, here I actually did something which you sometimes find in very old textbooks or lab classes, the tasting test. Normally it's not recommended anymore nowadays for qualitative analysis for good reasons. For this solution I actually did the tasting test. Uh, so we heated it so that uh, that uh, all the high mass were also broken down, neutralized the carbon solution and still acidic. And then I really stuck my finger in it and it, it's sugar. It tastes like sugar. I mean, the, that's, of course, we all know that it's from Nespain, but I, I wanted the central uh, exercise. Now, let's look for mechanical chemical synthesis supported catalysts. In TACO, catalysts are at least part of what uh, people are working on, and there are people working on supported catalysts. Thank you. And uh, if you want to produce supported catalysts, there are many different methods. I just wrote two from, from this regular type paper here, which had a, had a nice figure here. We can have a dry impregnation method, we have a solution of what we want to be part of support. We have support so that all the liquids up that you wash, dry, sign, reduce, whatever, to produce nanoparticles supported on your, your support oxygen. You may use wind synthesis, have an excess, then dry, a filter, then dry, you may pre synthesize colloids, you put them on the support, dry, wash, and so on, all relatively elaborate processes. And we, by, I, I have to say, by chance, ran into a synthesis method for the board catalyst by Warner. Actually, this, this was when we tried a reaction under uh, gas flow, and we later put gold in some grinding medium, titanium in that case, later analyzed the powder we found. We had nanometer sized gold particles in the titanium. So we said, hey, that looks like a synthetic method for uh, supporting chemicals. So this is how it works. You take macroscopic gold powder with black micrometer, 10 micrometer particle size. You put it in a ball mill together with a support optimizer. This can be alumina, it can be titanium, it can be medium oxide, many oxides do work. We mill for some time. And then you analyze the power afterwards, and you find you have sizes of average here four nanometer size wood particles on an alumina support, same four nanometer size particles in the titanium support. Not easy, well, it's really difficult to make these materials, but one and getting these types of Particle sizes is actually quite surprising. Normally, grinding gives you particle sizes in the order of 500 nanometer, and then you have an agglomeration diminution, equilibrium, or steady state. Here, this is the final state. You can build for hours, it stays like this. Um, if you look at it in the actual diffraction pattern, you can follow at different times what has happened so far. So, this is the starting point. The titania anatase, this is the anatase uh, x ray pattern. Then you have gold powder, and you should see here the sharp reflections for the gold. Uh, here is another one, uh, here is one underneath. And then you mill, and you see these reflections get broader, broader, broader. And then they're very really difficult to distinguish. This is the line drawn in the powder pattern due to the region's particle size. You also see something else. We, we will come back to it later. The anatase, which we started with, intermediately converts to glucide, and at the very end, to the thermodynamically stable titanium rutile. 
this is a really awesome to produce face changes. And by optimizing root type is more and more difficult to make it into media phase here. The root type has pretty reasonably high factors. So it's also for the simple for the specific phase. The catalysts are at least as active as the one you do by a typical recognition procedure. This is low oxidation in that big reaction. Some activity and some reaction, nothing special. And you see gold on alumina has a decent curve. In the literature gold on alumina, this is the half conversion temperature, 160 plus centigrades. If you have incipient wetness impregnated gold on alumina, that's a 450 centigrades. Note here it is gamma alumina, here I say alpha alumina. I'll show you later the reason why you compare to a different type of alumina. This is titanium, 71 centigrades for half conversion. This is not the very highest activity you can get. That's something you get by the position precipitation reaction that compared to a normal impregnation, incident wetness impregnation. This is not higher than you would get. So it gives you very decent, useful catalysts. And last observed, can we also use it for making multi metallic supported? So we just added two different metals, milled them with a the support under basically the same conditions, and saw what we got. And here are just two examples. We have by now several ten examples, I would say. Uh, gold on uh, gold palladium alloy on this was one thing on alumina. Here you see the elemental mapping, and you see wherever there is gold, there is palladium. Here, here. And for another system, gold or copper oxide, no, I have to say this is magnesium oxide. Okay. But it doesn't really matter that the system was chosen so that we had good contrast in the, in the electro microscope and that we had no overlapping peaks in the x ray. So it's a model system. Uh, but as I said, by now we have done that for many other systems. Wherever there is gold, between here there is copper. So you get alloy nanoparticles. If you analyze in the X-ray uh, by a little and small composition that corresponds to the composition of the copper into the system, um, the gold stone can be used as a method to make I would call them impossible alloys to at least difficult to get alloys. Platinum gold, platinum palladium do not like to alloy. You typically need 850 for the platinum gold and 1100 for platinum palladium to make them by a normal thermal method. They have a visibility gap at room temperature. If you do it in the middle, the alloy just falls more or less, uh, would have said naturally, but it's unnatural. They couldn't fall, but they do fall. And here you see a light scan over these particles over there, and you see whether there is gold, there is platinum. Gold, gold is a lot of platinum. And here is platinum, palladium, there is platinum, there is palladium, platinum, the green one is palladium. What other, uh, the, the, the um, blue one, one is palladium. The red one, is actually something we don't really want in there, and that's the dirty little little secret of the people who are milling. We always have abrasion from the milling angle. So if you use a stainless steel ball and a stainless steel vessel, the iron from the stainless steel is abraded and ends up somewhere in the product. We actually can get them shining uh, particles from platinum palladium. Uh, and I can avoid that. We have done that by just using the lamming, milling equipment, and we have more iron uh, cool to spread. So it tells us among the innocent the lamming materials. We have looked at this alloying process in a time result manner to get some information. So we've taken samples at different times in the milling, analyzed by x ray refraction. What you see. Is actually, if we take this example here, first the reflections of the individual. Here is a silver and palladium, the individual metals that brought it, brought it, brought it. 
And only when the individual particles are sufficiently small, then they actually start to elevate. We get this reflection here in the middle, which indicates the formation of the element. And so uh, what we think happens in this mechanical chemical alloying, so this is a supported catalyst, is we get these fine nanoparticles from the support, and then when individual support particles hit, there is a relatively high probability the particles are sufficiently small and there are sufficiently many of them. The two of the metal particles, unlike metal particles, collide with each other. They interfuse during the collision event. When they separate, they have a string to few atoms. And if you do that for two hours, eventually you end up with a lot of nanoparticles corresponding to the, uh, what you have uh, given into the system. Now we come to the, to the point where I alerted you to uh, five slides before. Why did we compare the gold of gamma alumina catalysts with the conventionally synthesized gold of alpha alumina catalysts? The reason is relatively simple, but for us, probably surprising. You can, by milling, produce gold in the very gentle conditions. Normally, if you want to produce alpha alumina, you start with some octahydroxyl precursor. You need you get a gamma alumina intermediate, you get other intermediates, kappa, theta, eta, whatever. There are many transition aluminas, and eventually, at something like 1200, 1300, 1400 centigrades, you finally get alpha alumina. The problem is, if you're at 1400 centigrades, you get severe spectrum. The particles are really big, one catalyst. You don't get 100 square meters per gram specific target area of the support. You get what's on the like that. There is a way to produce high surface area on the alumina that goes through this oxy hydroxide called diaspore. And diaspore has the same oxygen sublattice and the same sublattice of alpha alumina, so that's easy to transport. We don't have to change the oxygen sublattice here, and this is why it needs to high temperatures. So, here, something like 550 centigrades is sufficient to get alpha alumina. This alpha alumina has the same surface area. So, that looks simple. Tiny little problem the synthesis of diaspore. Requires 1200 bars, 35 days in the temperature of 150 centigrade. That's not very practical. So, the high surface area of alpha is almost impossible to get. And we found, again by chance, since we think we have the supported gold catalyst, if you, uh, if you know who might, for three hours at room temperature, you do alpha alumina. This alpha alumina has 130 square meters per gram, tiny little particles. You can see this here in the actual diffraction pattern. So you start with the yeah, you start with the bromide. You need to get some diaspore in between. After three hours, you have almost pure alpha alumina. There is a tiny bit of diaspore still in there. And since we didn't want to wait so long, we just heat it gently, converted the rest of the ice to alpha alumina. This is what it looks like. So, very tiny particles, 15 to 20 nanometer particle size, alpha alumina, which you normally have in big chunks. Again, we need to tell you the dirty little secret. This is an tungsten carbide mill. This is what the powder looks like when you take it off. There is tungsten carbide duration from the milling vessel. Fortunately, tungsten carbide can be relatively easily removed by an oxidative treatment for a few minutes, 5% nitric acid, hydrogen peroxide, and you get white powder, which is essentially pure alcohol. The problem is the scaling still. We haven't been able to scale it up. To the underground scale because this big symbol lawyer, if we do that with a ceramic net where we don't have the continuation, uh, the ceramic rates after five hours, we have to develop 
other mid types. There, there is actually big industrial supply service area of our mid types. So we continue working on that. Just to illustrate it a bit more, this problem with the contamination is something to always keep in mind when you do milling. Here is milling time in a stainless steel vessel, different frequencies. You can see you have several percent of iron in the product. Here, the same for a tungsten carbide vessel, several percent of tungsten in the product, and also cobalt. Cobalt is the binder in a hard material tungsten carbide uh, system, so there's always some cobalt in it. If you want the catalyst money, you, you really don't want metallic impurities. And so then we use either polluter milling equipment, zirconium milling equipment, silicon carbide milling equipment, but the, but the foreign elements are more or less innocuous. It is just to put each system you have then to optimize the milling conditions because the way the velocities, the impact are different. And so different milling equipment you have to optimize the system. The materials that you have favorable properties. Alpha alumina in general is used as a support for cobalt particles, which are used as crystal graph catalysts. That's the standard uh, industry type uh, crystal graph uh, catalyst. Gamma alumina supported cobalt particles. The problem is that gamma alumina under the conditions of the crystal graph reaction, where you have hydrothermal conditions, there is water flowing. The gamma alumina weathers, which means it reconverts to science and to gamma aluminum oxyl hydroxide to the vermont. The alpha alumina doesn't do that. The alpha alumina is totally stable, so we have used uh, here you can see the corresponding experiment. This was the gamma alumina, it's space gamma alumina after five hours of thermal conditions. The gamma alumina rehydrates to bromide and then it's basically not good anymore in the Fischer Koch reaction. Activities, selectivities of the gamma alumina and the alpha alumina constructive materials are essentially identical. So if one could make it high amounts without impurities, iron is also a good Fischer Koch catalyst to produce a different chain length uh, for the hydrocarbon, so we don't want that in there. And this could be a very interesting uh, option for the new more stable catalyst. And another thought for there is really interesting. Sometimes you want to change the hydrophilicity, hydrophilicity of materials. And one way of converting a hydrophilic material, which has a lot of overheat producing process, to a hydrophobic material is the so called dry. Massal simulation or alkyl simulation to try to anchor a silicon atom with attached alkyl groups to its surface. Which you can do by such a process. You can take, for instance, the trimethoxy here is a C18 carbon chain. You reflux it only for one, two, three days. And then you have a surface functionalized group. The OH groups on the surface we act with the epoxy or the hydrolyzed epoxy groups. You get an organically functionalized surface. In non aqueous conditions, absolutely water free, long reaction time. You can do the same at room temperature without any solvent in about five minutes. And you get a hydrophobic. Functionalized oxide. And it doesn't really matter which kind of oxide you is to come off, and if you can tell you which oxide it is, you can't do it for several weeks. As long as you have a wage boost and perfectly react, and you get an hydrophobic surface, that was the very end of it. Now, to the last point, which for me is to me the, the still most mysterious one catalysis in the milling. For catalysis in the building, I mean, you can of course do better reactants, but I'm a heterogeneous catalysis production. Heterogeneous catalysis production that it takes under continuous conditions in the flow reactor. So we modified our building system to act like a flow reactor. Reaction engineering wise, it is part of particular technical university. Reaction engineering wise, this is actually rather more continuous with the tank reactor. Uh, than, than a flow reactor because it's extremely well mixed. 
And we take one of these shade canals, we have the milling vessels, which are just sitting on arms, penetrating back and forth, filling the walls. And we have modified the vessels by having a gas inlet and a gas outlet. The gas outlet is this little tunnel over here that prevents the powder within the mill to be entering and turned out. So the tunnel is a bit not reaction engineering wise, but it's the same function. It acts a bit like a cyclone filter and feeds the powder back into the mill vessel. Um, so that was just some details. We can heat it, we can add temperature sensors, the equipment can be pressurized if you construct them in the right way to about 100 bars. So it's a quite versatile system. And we can do the milling under reaction function or do the chemical reaction, the catalytic reaction while we are milling. This is what we did here, starting again with the guinea pig CO oxidation. Uh, the catalyst in this. The, 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 yeah, the chromium oxide. Chromium oxide is, a, is an oxide which is not known to catalyze CO off of a chemical character. You can put it as low reactive, low CO and off, and over it, and there is nothing which happens. If you put it together with stainless steel walls in the middle, you see the detailed conditions. You switch the mill on, you see first it starts, and then slowly, slowly, slowly. Starts to convert about 30 percent of the carbon monoxide to switch off the mill. In case no activity, you switch off the mill again. Activity is there, switch off, switch on. You need milling to observe conversion on the instrument. We did many uh, blank and check experiments, and it's clear from these experiments you need the milling to get high activity. We have taken the powder after this experiment here because during the milling, you also create smaller particles, so you cannot compare it to the flat powder and fit the powder in a more normal flux flow reactor and it was dead at room temperature. You had to heat up to about 100 centigrade to get some conversion over this power. And if you then do an immediate side analysis, which is only moderately just the kind. You find you have about three orders of magnitude higher activity when you have the mill on than when you have the mill off. Um, we also did an experiment where selectivity was important. So, carbon monoxide, oxygen, in hydrogen. It's important in, 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 for fuel cells because gases for the fuel cells often have carbon monoxide impurities. You want to hydrogenate. To, to oxidize the carbon monoxide out of the gas without touching the hydrogen because the hydrogen is your fuel for the fuel cells, so the gas will not be oxidized. Over a copper oxide, chromium oxide catalyst, we actually get a very strange behavior. Let's start here. Here it's relatively normal. Blue is conversion, red is selectivity for steel oxidation instead of hydrogen oxidation. So from 70 centigrade on, we get more conversion and selectivity slightly drops. The strange thing happens when you go to lower temperatures. When we lower the temperature, blue is conversion, conversion to something. Strange. Normally, activation energy tells you you have to increase temperature for conversion to blue. And at the same time, also, the selectivity goes up, reaches almost 100% at minus 30 centigrade. So, we have here a reaction with a negative apparent activation energy, which is not unheard of in catalysis. It's, it's often the competition or the interplay between absorption and surface reaction. Here we think we have the interplay between the surface reaction, which has a normal activation energy, and the heating. Process of high activity defense, which are responsible for high reactivity here. The higher the temperature, the faster the high activity defense is banished again during the milling process. And this is the way between activation energy of the defect medium and activation energy of the circuit reaction leads to this uh, negative apparent activation energy. You do the same in the flux flow reactor, and there you have what you expect increasing temperature. Increasing conversion and sometimes it deactivates. We never get the kind of activity and productivity that we have. 
it tells us we have a very specific effect. So it is not durable, but probably high activity effects. And trends we create, which are not persistent, and we switch them around, they will probably put it in a platform reactor. It looks more or less normal. Coming to the next to last example, uh, this was also a very interesting mechanical chemical coordination uh, reaction coordination of methane, very difficult to functionalize molecule to monochloro methane. We do that with trichloracyanuric acid. It's a relatively cheap compound. It's used uh, for aquariums, for chlorination of aquarium without the fish dye. So people have fish tanks at home, know the chlorine, to get it in, in the pet store. Actually, the chlorine is liberated. You know, uh, are left with cyanuric acid. We know it's a radical process. It's one of the very few processes where we know what's going on by radical capture experiments. And the Celia is a catalyst in the mill. We have productivity of 150 grams of monochrome methane per kilogram catalyst an hour. That's the activity you have in large scale industrial processes. I mean, if you just want to get an estimate how accurate should the catalyst be, just remember that the gram per gram an hour is something you want to have in an industrial process. So, this is the scale where we are approximately at this process and getting 100% solubility for one or thing is uh, very difficult. So, that, that, that was a quite surprising finding. Last one was my early day when I started with ball milling, that would be the actions on the ball milling. I always said I would make ammonia synthesis at level temperature at atmospheric pressure. So we had been working on this for quite a while. It had been studied, but I would say very fishy results already in the 1960s. In East Germany, there was a group of Leipzig who actually did, at that time, they called it tribal chemistry. So, the same thing as McCall chemistry, but there were already activities at that time. They reported in a very sketchy publication, I would say, we have seen some traces of them. It was not described how they detected it. The setup was not described, so there seems to be some kinds of incident. When we were working on this, there was a group called the Mechanical Group. They would first produce mechanically an iron nitride, then take the iron nitride and react it with hydrogen in a second step. To produce ammonia, the least iron would be renitrated to nitrate. So that's the chemical looping, looping process, uh, which was already closed. Uh, Stefan Reichter is still working on it after many experiments. I really admired Stefan because he was really persistent in running these experiments. I would probably have him up somewhere. On the way and said, forget it, you can move from top of this is not going anywhere. But Stefan stayed at it, uh, modified the building systems and so on, and finally found the iron, which is the standard carbon metalist, but it needs to be modified with metallic alkali, rubidium and cesium workers. In the standard carbon catalyst, you have cesium oxide or rubidium oxide. If you look into the mechanism, cesium or rubidium would actually be better because it provides more electrons, which is important in the reaction. But for the standard power you can use cesium and rubidium because it's one with forty fifty centigrades, and then metallic cesium and rubidium evaporates, never stay on the catalyst. We are running at room temperature, so we can use uh, the need to help the light metals in modifying the catalysts. And then Stefan did that. But this was actually one of the experiments. He had also an analytics mind, and I'll show you this two analytics. But this was the one he showed me for that, that he looked on in the normal. And the indicated paper, the red indicated paper. This is the effluent from the milling reactor while it's running. If you see the indicated paper comes through, there is something basic there. The basic is unknown. You could also smell it. Then we did, of course, as I mentioned, of course, analytics uh, on the system. We don't really see 
the different ones, the green one, the black one, spending all over something like altogether 70 hours. The spikes here is shut down during night because we don't want to run that uh, the mill running overnight. So this is an experiment for one, two, three, four, five, six days. And you see the curves are more or less superimposed exactly over each other. So if you have the right conditions and do everything the same, same filling degree of your mill, same balls. You can reproducibly run million experiments. You see that at about 0.5.3 percent of ammonia at room temperature here at 20 bars. Here we did the experiment at room temperature and atmospheric pressure, and even there we still get 0.15 percent of ammonia uh, while we are milling. Only when we are milling, otherwise it's truly really dead. The reason why this uh, shutdown signal is now positive instead of negative it can be explained it takes a bit longer it's just technical reason how this uh, how vessels are constructed um we were a bit worried about this decaying activity here because we thought well, maybe there is some water traces which somehow like this iron nitride and everything and uh, so I was very skeptical and asked to repeat many experiments. Eventually, we came to the conclusion that maybe we lost the helium by oxygen from the stainless steel. Even the even stainless steel has a further part by layer to at least some extent. The ball could be a bit oxygen down there. And when you mill long enough, the cesium reacts with the oxygen from the stainless. And it's optimized to be mocked up and use its ability. We said, well, let's just add more cesium. So, this was the previous experiment. By the way, we can get cesium and we double the cesium amount. You see, it is now active over about 100 hours in two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight days uh, running with the night shut down. And you see, this is the x ray pattern. After the reaction, we see we indeed some of the sodium is even hydroxide, and the rest of the tree is even lighter. You can boost, no, it's boost, improve, let's say improved. It can improve the ammonia concentration yield at the outlet by turning around with the hydrogen nitrogen ratio. Here we get about half a percent of ammonia at its truly balanced room temperature. And we're still trying to optimize this little further. It actually did make headlines. Uh, we made it into the chemistry and engineering news, and they find a nice uh, title, Smashing and Monus. Just check out the light. It's not, not uh, mine. And it even made it into some of the other mine animals. Really easy to get. It tells its work in Portugal. It was only picked up and they found it sufficiently interesting. With this, I hope I could show you that, that first of all, the common chemistry and the common catalysis is, is not really, it, it's reproducible. We can do many different things with it, sometimes with kinds of things, but there aren't many things you can do. I hope I could show you uh, the syllables and not even on there, because it's longer ago. We produce uh, supported metal particles even with impossible or Hardly possible alloys. Um, I have shown you the alpha alumina, which we can convert also to a catalyst. Uh, here at the other catalyst, again, ammonia synthesis has the most, I would say, um, exciting result for the catalytic reaction of the milling. So that keeps us busy. And I have about four days left before I retire. In these five years, the only thing that happens. So we know why it does, and I hope that Rika and uh, her team will be part of this uh, endeavor over the next five years. I want to finish without, of course, thanking you, you guys online who also saw the presentation. But work like this is always the work of a big group. And in the first slide, I have added the people who work on a specific project. 
but a group only works as a group of people who have nothing to do with the particular research and can still be able to be there, create a nice atmosphere. And this is why, why I would like to thank the whole team, not just the ones in particular who are um, being listened to this, but of course, we want to thank them especially. And one person was often in many presentations not mentioned, not this one, but the generic both, I guess, the guys in the direction. Because something like that, you can only do if you have great workshop people who keep the system running, who make that, and there was constructive essence who give their intellectual input. So, this is what I want to highlight both from the previous team, especially because they tend to get the bottom, not in the Thank you very much.